In the Gospel story of Mark chapter 10 verses 35 to 45, two followers of Jesus who are blood relatives, James and John, attempt to place themselves at a much higher honor ranking than their fellow faction members. Why would they do such a thing? Please read the Gospel passage of Mark chapter 10 verses 35 through 45. And then let's discuss the following subjects from this section. How did people in Jesus' world acquire honor? How was honor assigned to biblical peoples? And what was the new way Jesus proposed regarding true honor? Scholar Gerd Thiessen explains that the Jesus movement was a first century Palestinian Israelite renewal movement composed of socially uprooted wandering Israelites who left their villages, homes, families, wealth, and safety to pursue a radical lifestyle of voluntary poverty and who were supported from time to time by local sympathizers in Galilean villages. Mark chapter 10 verses 35 to 45 presents a curious story about the Jesus movement. It concerns members of Jesus' core group competing for honor and the status that derives from it. Core members James and John, blood relatives, wished to be honored above the rest of the twelve, Jesus' innermost circle. The group that Jesus gathered around himself is technically called a faction. Members of such a group or coalition each have a direct, important, and relatively strong relationship with the faction leader, Jesus in this case, and this is represented in the red arrows. Also, within the core of Jesus' faction, there are biological or otherwise close pairs who have direct, important, and relatively strong relationships between each other. This is represented by the other colored circles and lines. Even though all members of Jesus' coalition have a direct, important, and relatively strong relationship with him, the faction leader, they possess very little knowledge of or relationship with each other. This is represented by the black lines. It should be pointed out that no person on this diagram is a Western individualist. All are collectivistic dyadic personalities, each sharing a group self with a group conscience. In this story, James and John, two blood relatives, do something very normal and quite customary in this culture within factions. They jockey for a higher position of honor in the group, and they don't give a damn about the others. When Jesus receives his glory from the God of Israel, that is, when he gets his full measure of honor, these two brothers want to share in it by gaining the most prestigious positions next to him. In the Mediterranean cultural world of the Gospels, everything is always about honor. In fact, every page, every sentence of the Bible is seasoned with concern for honor, the core cultural value of the Mediterranean world. And if you can't see that, then you are misunderstanding scripture, guaranteed. In Jesus' faction, each group member already possesses a degree of honor that derives from his birth, that is his ascribed honor. Nothing can be added to or subtracted from that honor. Even the lowliest of peasant day laborer nothing people, like Jesus and his fishermen followers, have some tiny little degree, some little speck of honor. Thus, Jesus from Nazareth is an artisan's son. That is his ascribed honor. Simon and Andrew are sons of the fisherman Jonah. That is their ascribed honor, as James and John are sons of Zebedee the fisherman. That is their ascribed honor. But in the Mediterranean world of the Bible, honor can also be achieved. Most often through honor contests, known as challenge and repost. Where one person asks another questions in hopes of shaming him and thereby increasing his own honor. The request of James and John is still another way of achieving honor, through personal effort. Here, the effort is little more than the request for a favor. Since Jesus is the acknowledged faction leader, the leader of this group, he can do a favor for individual members, 
and grant them privileges that would make them stand out in relationship to others. Of course, the others are incensed to learn of this move by James and John, and they express their indignation. James and John have provoked envy in the other ten core members. Instead of granting the favor, Jesus asks if the brothers can drink the cup that he drinks, which constitutes his claim to achieved honor. What Jesus is really asking is, will you be able to share my fate? Like all metaphors, the cup also developed from a real-life custom. Throughout the circum-Mediterranean world, the head of the family fills the cup of all at table. Each male is expected to accept and drink what the head of the family has given him. Since all God talk or theology is based on analogy, and all analogy is rooted in culturally specific human experience, and the behavior of God is assumed to be like the behavior of human beings within a given culture, the cup came to represent the lot in life which God has assigned for each person. The cup then is their fate. If Jesus accepts his assigned lot in life, his fate, then he will attain the honor determined by God. The brothers James and John impetuously affirm that they can indeed accept and fulfill the same lot assigned to Jesus. At this point, Jesus reminds the two brothers that he is just a broker of Israelite theocracy and not its patron. To use an analogy from the Godfather movies, Jesus is not the Don. Instead, Jesus is like Tom Hagen. Tom Hagen is the broker that gets you in to see Don Vito, the patron. To put all the focus on Tom Hagen instead of the Don is to confuse and misunderstand the Godfather films. In the same way, to place all the focus on Jesus the Broker instead of the patron God of Israel is to confuse and misunderstand the New Testament. Jesus, the shamanic holy man Broker, can put others in touch with God the patron in alternate reality, but it is God alone who determines each person's lot and deserved honor. This is extremely important to realize, especially for Christian readers of the Bible. To read the New Testament in a Christocentric way is to miss the thrust of all 27 documents. Only centuries later in Christianity does Christ emerge as the focus. Continuing his reflection on true honor, the Mark of Jesus invites his entire political religious faction to reflect upon life as they know it. The Mediterranean outsiders, from non-Judean rulers and great men, know how to determine personal status and how to behave accordingly. These rulers lorded it over their subjects because this was precisely how one exercised authority within their social world. But the Mark and Jesus proposed a different way for renewed Israelite society. The new way of Jesus was the way of status reversal. The great ones in this community, the Mark and Jesus group, should behave like slaves or servants at ceremonial meals. That is, like diakonoi. Those who hold positions of primacy should consider their status as equal to that of slaves. The reason for this new rule in determining true honor in the Jesus movement lies in the behavior of the Son of Man who served, meaning played the role of a diakonos, and gave his life as a ransom so that others could be set free. What would prompt an invading power or an oppressor to accept one hostage and then let others go free? Only the fact that the hostage was of higher status. An invading power would gladly accept a prince or king as hostage and let the peasant go free. There is more prestige to holding, and perhaps executing, royalty than slaughtering large numbers of peasant nothing people. In the game of chess, capturing the king ends the game, even if all the other pieces were still on the board. 
In the Markan narrative, Jesus is at the start identified as being the Son of God. That is, God's holy man. So from the beginning, this gospel proclaims Jesus' unassailably high honor status, even though all who historically knew him and looked on him would have seen a peasant nothing person from a nothing place village like Nazareth. If someone of Jesus' holy man high social status sacrificed himself for the benefit of others not so highly honored, how would such logic translate into American politics? Or the American church? Millions of dollars were used to build a mansion for the Archbishop, for one man. It's over 6,000 square feet on two acres in the most exclusive area of Atlanta. And millions of dollars to renovate uh, a lovely home for the parish priests of the Cathedral of Christ the King. Having two homes on two beautiful lots in very, very exclusive neighborhoods does not represent all of the people in the Catholic Church. And Pope Francis has asked us to be particularly concerned about the poor and the disenfranchised, who make up a large majority of the Catholic Church.